looks like we're good. All right, for recent space news. Now, this really covers two months. Normally, it's just a month between meetings, but we didn't have one last month, so it's two months. I'll just talk twice as fast, no problem. First topic is going to be Psyche, which is a mission to a metal-rich asteroid. Now, Psyche is the name of the asteroid and is also the name of the mission to it. The spacecraft you see in the picture here is the one that's going to it. Uh, part of that picture is cut off, but it is symmetrical in, in its solar arrays there. It just launched on October 13th and on a Falcon Heavy, and it will arrive in 2029. So you have to wait a while to get results from this. It takes that long to get there. It'll orbit it for at least 26 months, but probably forever. There's probably not going to be enough fuel to actually go anywhere else after that. So it'll, it'll be there essentially forever. That's the plan anyway. The launch is on a Falcon Heavy, and this is uh, just before you know ignition really cut in. Um, if you look closely through the the haze of all the the fuel vapors, you can see the you know there are indeed the two side boosters, which of course land again after after the center core takes off. So why does anybody want to go to Psyche anyway? Two reasons really, major ones. One is scientific, and the other is uh, economic. The scientific, that's what drives decisions right now, certainly. This is the first visit ever to a metal-rich asteroid. We visited, well, actually, I should say the Japanese have visited two other asteroids in the past and returned samples from them. We visited lots of asteroids, but this is actually a sample return mission. This is actually the largest of the metallic asteroids. There are only about nine that are known that are, that are heavily metallic like this, so this is kind of a big deal. It might be part of the nickel-iron core of a protoplanet, meaning one that was in the process of forming and never completed, or maybe one that got smashed up just due to collisions with, with other asteroids. We don't quite know. Hopefully we can learn more about that. You think about it, we don't even know that much about Earth's core. You know, we have rough ideas, but that's why scientists are so interested to see, well, what's there? Because we can actually go look at that. It's cold. You know, you don't have to go and get melted, you know, to go see it. Um, and of course, this will give us clues in general about the formation of the rocky planets. Now, the other reason for the long term is it's metal rich. Like I said, the Japanese have visited two other asteroids. Those are mostly carboniferous asteroids. They have a lot of carbon, loose piles of rubble. This one is truly different. The prospecting angle is, is unique because sooner or later, that is a lot of metal, and we're going to want to use that. And it probably isn't going to be economical, at least with the current technology and for quite a while, to ever really bring that back to Earth. But once the space economy gets going, there's enough metal here to power it for centuries. So, you know, there's definite reasons to, to visit this. So some fun facts. It's about 173 miles at its biggest dimension. It's potato shaped. Now they had an interview with the, the lady who is the principal investigator for this project. And she admitted that, well, actually potatoes can be shaped like almost anything. So we, we say that asteroids are typically potato shaped because we're never wrong. <laughs> so um, surface area, roughly the size of Texas or California, take your pick, you know. No, none of these things are known exactly. They're all estimates because it's still pretty far away and it's not that big. But they do have estimates from a variety of reasons. You can look at things like what are the perturbations of orbits of objects near it. You can look at the light reflected from it and try to derive information about what it's made of. So there's been a lot of study of this asteroid. And they have concluded that its density is between 212 and 256 pounds per cubic foot. So to put that in perspective, Water is at 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, so that's, that's one density. Rocks are typically heavier, most of them, maybe by a factor of two or so, and this is more so than that. So that's one of the reasons they're pretty sure there's a lot of metal in here. The metal is heavier in general. The mass of this thing is 1% of the mass of the entire asteroid belt. Again, these are all estimates, but it is the best that we have so far. So that kind of says this one's worth going to. It is the biggest, and let's go there. So eventually it'll be mining. And of course, people immediately say, well, gee, what would that be worth? Making some rough estimates on the, on the metals that are there. They say, well, that's worth about 10 quintillion dollars. And that's plus or minus a couple of orders of magnitude. Your estimates may vary. But of course, it's not realistic because we don't have any technology really to mine it right now and to get it back to Earth and get it down to Earth. So again, it's really more of a long range play. Estimates vary at uh, between 30 and 60% metal uh, by volume on this whole thing. So the key thing here is that, yeah, maybe we're not going to be mining it right away, but it's a reminder that the resources in space are vast. They totally outclass just the tiny little bit that we have on Earth, and we just need to get there and get started. Once we ramp up, there's just a lot more we'll be able to do. The ultimate use is really manufacturing in space for use in space. Now, there have been uh, changes over time in the estimates of how much metal there is. 
On the left-hand side of this diagram, there's an earlier artist rendition of what they thought this uh, asteroid might look like. And you'll notice it has a lot more metallic gray looking stuff. That's because they thought it was like 60%. Now they're thinking, well, it maybe it's more rocky than that. So you can see the updated version. You know, the updated version's changed, but pretty soon we'll find out what it really looks like. Finally, you can see a picture of the entire spacecraft here. By the way, that part in the center is about three meters or so. It's about 10 feet at its biggest dimension. The whole thing with the solar rays extended, it's about the size of a tennis court, almost as big as a tennis court. And what's the payload? Well, first of all, they want to analyze what this stuff is. So they have several ways of analyzing. One of the ways is this visible spectrum. They can try to look at different wavelengths of light, and they know that different elements reflect things differently, and so they can guess that. They have these other spectrometers based on gamma rays and neutrons, and those are kind of interesting. That's because they assume there's background radiation, cosmic rays and so on. There's gamma rays, and there's also just neutrons that go flying around. Based on how they interact, they can actually make judgments of what's there. And that's something you can't actually do on Earth because too much stuff gets absorbed in, in the Van Allen radiation belts and air and so on. And they're also going to study the magnetic fields. Of course, that's tied into the fact that it was an iron core. So things like, well, did it have a magnetic field? That probably would indicate the world was probably rotating at one time. And there's all kinds of things they can derive from that. They can figure out better estimates of the mass and the rotation by looking at things like a Doppler shift of radio waves, uh, things, things that they can do just even with position and radio, uh, radio analysis. And a totally independent test of this, for the first two years of this trip, which is before they get to the asteroid, they are going to experiment with laser communications could be much more efficient, potentially. The trick, of course, is can you keep it aimed? So in the, during the first two years, except when there's uh, occlusion by the sun or Earth, they will be attempting some laser communications. So that's kind of a separate, independent, but important test. In terms of the design, strangely enough, it's pretty much based on existing geosynchronous satellites, specifically the ones built by Maxar. They were the main contractor on this. Which is kind of interesting because it says that they really thought that the radiation environment of a geosynchronous satellite is not that different or not, not that much worse or better than what they're going to experience out there. So that was kind of interesting because part of, part of the rationale for NASA's Gateway project is that we'll get more experience with higher radiation environments. The reality is this other part of NASA figured out that it, it is about the same. You know, the uh, geosynchronous satellites, they're in actually the upper area of the Van Allen belts. So if anything, maybe it might be a little bit worse. So anyway, they're expecting that. Now there are differences though. If you're designing a craft like this, there's big differences in the solar power because you're so much farther away from Earth. Of course, you have a lot less of it. And so they have to account for that. And thermal management. One of the bigger problems for satellites up in space around Earth is keeping them cool enough when the sun's shining on them and then warm enough when they're eclipsed by the Earth. And here, they're so far away that the main problem is going to be keeping things warm enough. So there are some differences. But fundamentally, the satellite bus, the electronics, and a lot of that was pretty much derived from existing satellites. The mass of this thing, a little less than 6,000 pounds, you know, of which 3,600 pounds is uh, actual material, the rest of it's fuel. The payload, there was the part we're actually trying to get there, that's only 66 pounds. So you kind of think about this. This 5,700 pounds this is actually the payload for the Falcon that launches it, which is huge. I mean, many, many tons. And then this thing itself still is a rocket that has to get out there and deliver. And even at that, we're only putting 66 pounds there. That's why it's expensive. The large solar rays then will account for the distance from Earth, as I said, about the size of a tennis court when you expand them. And to get a feel for the challenge this is, near the Earth, you'd get about 21 kilowatts of power out of these arrays. Out at Psyche, it'll be between 2.3 and 3.4 kilowatts, so it's quite a drop. And well, and this is why traditionally most of the really deep space probes have typically had radioisotope generators, you know, because they just put out the heat and, and electricity on a regular basis. They decided they could get by without any of that, just using solar. That does say they have to have batteries on board because there are times when there's no sun, so they have to have that. As far as what this looked like, this is part of the, the solar arrays. Obviously, they have to fold up when they launch them, and then they expand them. In this case, they expand them two ways, out three, and then there's this, uh, two more on the side, and then there's two of these. So they, they're pretty good size. I included this diagram mainly just so you can see the picture of the person uh, to get a feel for, okay, it's bigger than a person, but it's not immense. This uh, DSOC on the left-hand side here, that's the laser communications experiment. That's kind of just bolted on to the rest of this. Thrusters are down at the bottom, spectrometers and communication antennas for the Earth uh, up there on top. The electric propulsion is kind of interesting. 
First of all, it's a Xenon Hall Effect thruster. And what is that? Well, that one is used on lots of satellites now. At least 30 of those geosynchronous satellites use a variation of this particular thruster. By the way, it's named for Hall. Now, Doug Hall, of course, is, is sitting right here. However, this is not you. This is Edwin Hall. He lived back in the 19th century. He's the one who discovered the Hall Effect. What that is, is basically the interaction between flowing electrical current and magnets. So if you have a, a flat surface with current flowing through it and a magnet going in one direction, the electrons then move in the third perpendicular direction and set up a difference in voltage. That's the basic principle, but somehow or other, they harness this in kind of a circular form and they make a, they make a motor out of it instead. Anyway, there's four of these things. These things take five kilowatts of power. Now, there are some that are bigger than that, but these are the ones that are in commercial use. They had to modify this so they could scale it down for use when they're way, way out there, down to like 0.9 kilowatts. Now, the thrust, though, is really tiny, 0.06 pounds. Essentially, think of the weight of a AA battery. The weight of that that you feel pushing against you, that's the force you're getting out of one of these motors. That's at 5 kilowatts. And, of course, it's less than that when you have a lower current. But the reason people use these is they're extremely efficient. The efficiency measure usually used is specific impulse. That's 1,800 seconds, totally dwarfing anything you know, we can get out of chemical or nuclear uh, so far. For instance, the Merlin engines, they're the ones used on the Falcon 9. They're maybe 300, less than that for atmospheric, a little greater than that for vacuum use once you're out in space. These things are so efficient, you're spitting out ions, but it has to be ions from something, and that's xenon in this case. They still have to carry about a couple thousand pounds of that, but that's probably about 10% of what they would have needed with standard chemical engines, so it saved quite a bit. This picture on the left-hand side shows it in operation. You get this bluish glow, a very nice, satisfying science fiction kind of look to it, right? Everybody loves that. The right-hand side is what it looks like when it's not in operation. Now, this one is a little bit different than a lot of launches in that there is absolutely no chemical propulsion once it's launched. And when there's, once the Falcon Heavy is done, that's it. Everything is just electric, and that's a little bit different. However, there are still what are called cold gas thrusters, which every rocket has. And they're like the simplest kind of engine you can have. You basically just have a tank full of a pressurized gas like nitrogen, nitrogen in their case, and you just open a valve and it goes shooting out, you know, in a compressed form, and, and that gives you thrust. You ultimately need some of that. For instance, if you're tumbling and you're out of control, you might not be getting enough solar power. Or if you happen to be in an eclipse behind an asteroid or something, you might not have electrical power. So you need to have something that will work. And that is actually why every rocket has these cold gas thrusters in one form or another. Yeah. Oh, the company makes it? You know, I'm not sure. It all goes back to Soviet technology, actually. I'm not sure who actually finally built this particular one. If you mentioned SpaceX, every one of their Starlink satellites has Hall Effect thrusters. They're probably a little smaller than this, but there's a couple of differences. When they started out, they said, you know, Xenon, that is apparently really efficient, but Krypton is a whole lot cheaper. It's actually one-tenth the cost. And so they started off using Krypton. And they take a bit of a hit on efficiency, but it still isn't too bad. Now, actually, their version 2 satellites, their version 1.5 even, they're down to using argon. They switched, and they actually made them more powerful than the Krypton version quite a bit. And that's another factor of 100 cheaper. So xenon, extremely expensive, of course, but it's traditional, and so that's what they're using. Other developments have made these things a lot cheaper to work with, uh, with SpaceX specifically. Actually, the Blue Origin is using engines too, but they're, they're still using crypto. Moving on. So the journey itself, this is kind of a busy diagram here, but you got the sun in the center of this thing. You got the blue circle representing the orbit of Earth. You got a, a red one indicating Mars. And then on the outer band here, you have Psyche. It's not the scale, but they're giving the idea here. So you launch. This is actually a quite simple orbit compared to almost every other one we've looked at lately. They pretty much just go and they get one gravity assist by flinging by Mars and getting pulled, getting pulled along for that. One gravity assist for Mars and that's it. Now, still, the whole thing takes many years to get there. But it's uh, a lot simpler than these ones we've looked at recently for going to the moon. Um, where you go out and back and all over the place. Now, the end point, once they get there, then, of course, they're going to orbit around Psyche. And they start off, they say, well, they don't really know enough about the structure of Psyche. They, th they think that it's very non-homogenous, meaning there's some places where it's really, really metal and other places where it's mostly rock, and there's big craters. There's at least two big craters, I'm pretty sure of that. So all that says is the gravity varies quite a bit. It doesn't have things like, you know, you have on Earth that tend to even out all those variations. It's frozen in place, so that gravity is really very, very erratic. As a result, picking out a stable orbit isn't that easy. 
So what they're doing is they're just going to circle around it from you know a distance at first, and they're going to map it and they understand that what the gravity looks like, and then gradually work their way down. Then. When they're in closest, they'll get some of the best measurements they're looking for, but they can't do that right away. Then they'll actually, they'll actually pull back a bit. But anyway, uh, that's the overall plan. So they'll be out there at, a, at the biggest distance from Psyche. They'll be 440 miles out. They'll get in as close as 47 miles. That's the plan. And this is different than the other asteroid return missions, the ones the Japanese did. Those asteroids were so small, they essentially had no gravity. They were, the orbits that they used were really just more like they kind of hovered and then they'd move a little bit and then they'd hover and move a little bit more because there just wasn't enough gravity to have much of an impact. This thing is heavy. It has gravity. It's nowhere near the weight of the moon. Way, way less than Earth, but still substantial enough to have actual orbits. Now, we were talking about the Japanese returns. We also have a sample return coming back uh, right now, or Cyrus-Rex. This thing was monitoring an asteroid called Bennu. And it's a carbonaceous rock, about a third of a mile in diameter. It was of special interest because they figured by the late 2100s, there was a 1 in 2700 chance it might hit Earth. And they thought, well, maybe it's a good idea to find out something about this. So if you're going to defend against it, you know, at least know what you're defending against. If it's really just a loose pile of rocks, you probably do something different than if it's a really solid piece of rock. So they did a mission. It was seven years also. This is a U.S. mission. Launched in 2016, got there in about 2018. It orbited just for a couple of years, just to, to pick out a spot to land. Again, orbiting mean kind of hover around. You might call it a smash and grab. If you look at this picture of the spacecraft, there's this thing coming down out of it, down on the right-hand side there of the slide. They basically just pretty much jammed it down, stirred up a whole bunch of dust and brought it back. And what they found out in doing that is this is one of those asteroids that also is called a rubble pile. It's pretty much low density, porous rocks, kind of a loose collection. But still, they managed, as a result, they managed to get lots and lots of sample. The sample return happened. It just occurred on September 24th. So the left-hand side here shows you the capsule that returned in. This is landing in the Utah desert. Then they shipped it off the Johnson Space Center for analysis. They're keeping 70% of it aside for analysis in the future because they know that we'll get better and better instrumentation, analysis techniques, and even ideas for what, what to look for. And you know, that's, that's true, and that's a good thing that they're doing that. That's the same thing has happened with the moon rocks. They'd always put some aside, and now we've done new things that we couldn't have done in the past. Now, the spacecraft is still up there, so it's now going out to the asteroid called Apophis, which is another one that may someday come near Earth, but anyway, that's probably about 2029 they'll get out there. So. This is another one of these craft where, because it uses ionic engines of one sort or another, they're pretty efficient and they can just go roaming around the universe, but they don't have time constraints. And that's why they can do that. They can take these very, very roundabout paths with gravity assist and that sort of thing that you could never do on a human mission. Okay, next topic. This is actually just a quote from the head of one of the companies I'm gonna talk about here. The next industrial revolution isn't on earth. And what does that mean? Well, it basically means manufacturing in space. And in particular, here we're just going to focus on low Earth orbit manufacturing. And that's a little different than some of the other ones we've talked about in the past, where in this case, you launch the Earth materials, you manufacture something, you make crystals or drugs or whatever it is, you return it to Earth, and then the product is used on Earth. And for instance, you might have this miniature factory. This is an example of one from a company called Barda. Most of that picture is actually the photon bus from Rocket Lab, so that's one possible approach. This differs from in situ resource utilization. We've talked about a lot about that in the past. For instance, Blue Origin has their proposal to make solar cells on the moon, where you use the lunar material to make it, and you then you use those solar cells on the moon, or maybe in orbit around the moon or around Earth for solar powered satellites to transmit power back to Earth or other manufacturing and mining operations, for instance, mining ice, you know, on the Mars or, or in the shaded areas of the moon, where with that, you can make water, you can make air, in particular, you can make propellant for the rockets. And so it's considered kind of going to be necessary that we do that for really expanding into space, because you need some way to get all that fuel, and it's just too expensive to bring it up from Earth. So, and we've talked about some of these companies before, Transastra and Astroforge, in particular, are working on mining of asteroids. Now, one thing we talk about manufacturing in low Earth orbit, we're not talking about assembling like cell phones or cars or something. You're really talking about making materials. That's what, that's what it's all about, is making materials. Because you can typically, 
if you figure the right ones out, you can make ones that are much higher purity or much lower defects, like crystal defects and that kind of thing. And that's been proven in enough experiments already on the ISS um, International Space Station. They've done a lot of tests on a whole variety of materials of actually making them in very small laboratory kind of uh, quantities. And you think about it, that actually the International Space Station is officially the ISS National Labs. And they are a laboratory kind of organization. And they've been doing these experiments. And now these people are saying, well, let's take it a little further. Let's assume we can do this. And they have pretty good basis for saying they can at this point. What products specifically can we do this with? Which ones will actually make money? And how do we scale it up for wider use? Those are questions you don't answer in a lab. Those are questions you have to pretty much do the, you call it, think of the pilot plant stage, where you need a bigger scale to get started and then even uh, bigger operations later on. So the companies involved in this heavily, there's Varda and Spaceforge are the two that are really doing the complete package of essentially manufacturing as a service. Then there's ones that have been in the business for a while, Redwire and Space Tango. They are thoroughly tied in with the International Space Station. Uh, let's back up to why we want to manufacture in low Earth orbit. It comes down to quality, either high purity or lower defects, something you can do better in space than you can do here. So why is that even possible? Well, the first part is microgravity, low, low gravity. The physical, what actually happens to materials is quite different up there. For instance, any processes on Earth are affected by convection, by buoyancy, by sedimentation. There's all kinds of things that happen because of gravity that don't happen up there. And sometimes all those things, as they happen, they get in the way of making highly pure materials. So it gives you much more possibilities of making perfect crystals, for instance, or other complicated structures. Making of human organs, that's one that's been tested out to some extent. It's got a long way to go. They could start out where they could do some 3D printing of a general scaffold kind of a structure at a very, very tiny level, but then they got to fill in with the cells. And the problem is keeping all that together well, you can do that when there's no gravity to pull it all down and just kind of, you know, make it turn into a big blob on the ground. You can do that better in space. So there's a lot of hope. The key is just figuring out what are the things we can make up there. Another way of looking at this is that different properties become important in space. For instance, surface tension totally dominates. You know, if you've got water, you know, and you, and you tip the glass sideways, it falls to the ground. Well, if you do that in space, it just kind of hovers together and actually surface tension holds it together. So it kind of gives you the idea that Typically, separation processes in particular are going to be quite different up there, and you may be able to exploit that. And again, that's what they hope to do. Okay, the second factor is vacuum. And that really has several implications. One is you just avoid a lot of contamination. On Earth, you know, even, in, you know, you have all these clean rooms and semiconductor manufacturing, very, very hard to actually get all the particulates out of the air. And it's a lot easier up there. There just aren't that many. Or the air itself, if you have a chemical reaction, with oxygen or nitrogen, things that are in the air, you can have chemical reactions. Those might interfere with what you're really trying to make. So that gives you an opportunity to do things differently. And of course, if you need low pressure, well, that's perfect. <laughs> you can't get much lower than that. Some separation processes, again, you do that at very, very low pressure and or low temperature, which is the third factor here. So for instance, a lot of cryogenic kind of stuff. When you have to use on Earth, we're using liquid air and liquid helium or nitrogen that's a whole lot easier to achieve up there. So there's reasons to believe that you can do a lot with manufacturing up there. Any process where crystallization is a factor, there's a pretty good chance you can do it better in space. One is the ability to separate them, but the main thing is you don't get the defects developing because you're not being pulled down by gravity. So semiconductors like gallium arsite is an example of a semiconductor that probably could be produced in space. Now, a lot of the chips that are made, the equipment to do that is just so vast, you're not going to be making entire chips up there. However, it has been proposed to make the substrates, there's basically the lowest level of the semiconductors. They rely on high purity um, crystals, crystal materials of either, well, either silicon or um, gallium arsenide, these kind of things. And they think they can do that better in space. So crystals are a big place. Pharmaceuticals in general is a high value kind of a thing. And definitely some, it has been proven that some of them can be made there. Now, some of that is because they use crystallization as part of it. So one of the companies in particular is focusing on protein crystallization and any drugs that they can make there, they think they can make better up in space. Um, other things that have been tried, fiber optic cable, and as I said before, human tissue and organs. So the key factor in all those is that they're high value, meaning the dollars per unit mass you know, is very, very high. And you need that because obviously it costs you a lot of money to get something up to space, do something with it, you know, bring it back down. So it better be I don't know, a small but very expensive product. And that's what they're looking for. Now, the place where some of these companies differ is space stations. 
Redwire and Space Tango, they kind of grew up in the International Space Station. Both of them, they've run a lot of experiments. Made in Space was a company that was actually bought by Redwire. So they've run all kinds of experiments in a whole variety of areas. But these newer companies, Varda and Space Forge, they actually are going the other direction. They're saying, ignore the space stations completely. What they're trying to do is provide a complete manufacturing and orbit service with reusable hardware. In other words, you tell them what you want, consistent with what they can produce. They take care of getting it up into space, running it, bringing it back down and delivering it to you. And that's a lot different than the space station case where you have to wait for a schedule, you know, where there's somebody going up. Humans have to take it and carry it in. They have to hook these things up to the power and everything. And then the biggest drawback is probably down mass. You know, you don't think about it too much, but we know how to get people up and back. Cargo, not so much. It's only the Cargo Dragon from SpaceX that even can bring anything back at this point. The space shuttle could, but everything else doesn't. And so you don't really have a lot of opportunities. You can bring back something on a Russian Soyuz craft if it fits in a briefcase. Yeah, <laughs> That's, and, you, and you're probably kind of crammed in there. Yeah, on their lap, pretty much. You do have a space in a Cargo Dragon, but they don't come back all that often. So you're kind of limited by a lot of things. The opportunity to bring things back, um, and then of course, how much it'll cost. So. The other thing is just basically they want fully automated processes. Once it takes off, there's just no human intervention required until it lands again. And it seems kind of ironic that here in NSS, we want to get people up into space and build civilization in space. But the reality is it's very expensive to put people in space. The way we're going to get there is by having as much automation as possible. So there's almost just no way around that. And here's an example of building up an economy that is somewhat space-based, but it actually requires automation to do it. And anyway, the other thing is then they scale up. If you want to start manufacturing more, you just do more launches. And that's something where you, when you're in more of a laboratory environment like the International Space Station, you just can't really ramp up like that. So they're just saying, let's solve the problem. Look at it as a logistics problem. And let's solve the whole problem, getting stuff up and getting it back. We've already proven the processes can work. Now let's just scale it up. So it's industrialization. I would say they're focusing on industrialization, cost, scalability, and scheduling. And that's what their business models are exploiting. The main factor driving all this is everybody's still waiting for Starship from SpaceX. If it's another factor of 10 cheaper, at least, the economy changes. And it's just a question of, well, hurry up and get here and do it already. Um, everybody's kind of waiting on that. And this is another example. Everybody's just waiting on the assumption that things are going to get cheaper and cheaper for getting up into space. So taking a look first at Space Forge, that's what the picture on the bottom of this shows. Some launcher got them up there. None of these companies make launchers. They, they assume they're using other people's stuff to get up there. That little satellite there, that's their product. It's a reusable satellite. You never really heard that term before, reusable satellite. Well, now you have. It's reusable. So it gets up there. It expands its solar cells, as shown in the bottom of that picture. Let's follow the rest of that life cycle. When it's done manufacturing inside that little cubicle, it has to fold the arrays back up. So the, the shows in that on the left here where you kind of start folding it back up. One thing they've done really uniquely is they're gonna land. They have a huge heat shield and there's no disposable tiles, there's no parachute and no flotation device. And you say, well, how are they doing that? I mean, everybody like the space shuttle and all that, they all had to have tiles, and ablative materials, air friction, that essentially vaporize. What it is is that they decided to go for a metallic object that's just really huge. You can't quite tell that in the middle picture here, but if you look at the recovery process, the little satellite on the right-hand side drawing here, that thing is really, really a small part of that. Recently, NASA has done some experiments with a heat shield that's been blown up. This thing just takes that much, much farther. It's some kind of woven metal cloth composite material. The big thing is it folds out like origami. It's so big and it has enough metal in it that it can radiate the heat away as it descends. And so they can just use it again. That's their, their hope anyway. Now, they've tried this at small scale up to maybe 10 miles. So they haven't actually gone beyond that. And of course, that means they really haven't been able to test it at really high speed. But they think this will work. They're pretty confident. They call this thing Predwit. Apparently, King Arthur had a, a magic shield that's named after that. So anyway, they have some fairly unique and interesting technology. The recovery, it's shown on the right side of this. It may look like a bunch of drones that are kind of holding up a net. And that's pretty much what it is, I think. Um, they're calling it a hover net. And I think what that means is they just took a bunch of drones and they, they send it out. They're doing a sea recovery, but maybe not too far out. And then they just they bring the thing back and they're going to catch it in the net. That's also partially so that they won't do too much damage on landing. You know, they won't have a really, really hard bump. The net will slow things down. And they've tested this one also up to about 10 miles anyway. So interesting stuff. 
Now, they have had a setback, however. Their launch system to get them up there, unfortunately for them, was Virgin Orbit. They were flying out of that Cornwall spaceport in the UK. And that was the mission that failed. It wasn't Space Voyager's fault. This was Virgin Orbit. They failed. They lost that satellite. And then actually the whole company failed. In June of 23, Virgin Orbit failed. So they're out of the picture. That's too bad for them because a lot of their support probably came from the UK, but based around a core tenant of their spaceport, which is going to be Virgin Orbit. So they're working that out. Now, Varda's a little different, but it's doing essentially the same thing, except they're landing on land. Three parts, they have the spacecraft bus, which in this case is actually the photon from Rocket Lab. Once it gets up there, it provides propulsion, power, and so on. Then there's the reentry capsule, which you can see in the picture here, like in the middle. And that's a much more conventional one, not that different in size than the fairings you were using to get it up there in the first place. They land it with a parachute. If you look at this picture, so this is the capsule, which you see in the second part. The capsule is that conical shaped thing that separates. The rest of this is all actually the photon was essentially a small satellite found a rocket lab. To get up there, they're flying up on a Falcon 9 transporter mission. They've already done it, the first one. So, but let's talk about the business model, first of all. Again, it's full logistics, free flying, self-sustaining, mass produced, not relying on the space station. Simple ballistic entry, you know, heat shields and parachutes. They're using more of the proven processes for this. Um, they think it's cheaper to land on the land faster than sea recovery. They're focusing on quick turnaround for reuse. Now, the key in both of these companies is focus on a simple process, one key process like crystallization, and do whatever you can with that. All the other stuff for manufacturing, you do that back on Earth. So you just get the high value part done in space, the rest on Earth. Their markets originally for Varda, pharmaceuticals for the most part, protein crystallization. Now, there's a problem with that, and that's that for drugs, you got to have clinical tests, you got to have FDA approval. That takes years. So they need revenue along the way. So they pivoted, and what they're doing is they're now starting going on hypersonic testing. The U.S. is kind of behind in, in hypersonic missiles and technology in general. So it kind of works out pretty well. Um, they're, they're pivoting. Rocket Lab is doing the same thing. Basically, providing a test environment. They're a test environment because they're coming from orbit. So that means you're going at least 17,000 miles an hour. They figure they can test up to about Mach 25. If you can test thermal protection, materials, sensors, all that kind of stuff. So they did their first orbital test. They actually, that went up in June for a one-month mission. And actually, they finished in a couple of weeks. So the manufacturing step was done on June 30th. It's still up there. Now, why is that? They expected to come down by parachute, but no, they're actually stuck. They don't have permission to land. What? <laughs> yeah, the FAA says, well, Varda, they launched their vehicle and they never got a re-entry license. And now, the thing is, there probably was no such thing as a re-entry license before because nobody ever wanted to. I mean, other than just as a byproduct, spent rocket stages and, and satellites at the end of life and that kind of thing. This is a whole new category, space mining, space manufacturing. If you're going to bring stuff back to Earth, that's a whole different animal. And nobody's set up for that yet. But also, the, even the Air Force, they were going to land on the same place where the OSIRIS-REx asteroid return sample was. Apparently, the Air Force never actually gave them permission to do that. So the blame here is unclear. I mean, it's hard to believe Varda is completely free of blame in this. I mean, they surely had to realize they needed some of this. But there is a general problem in the government right now of timely approvals. In, this, in their case, the launch approval was probably done through SpaceX because SpaceX launched the transporter mission that launched, you know, probably 50 or 60 different payloads. But, they, you know, SpaceX didn't care about where it comes down, so they, they wouldn't have gotten that. Maybe Varda just assumed that was included. Well, apparently it wasn't. So they're still negotiating how to get this thing back to Earth. But in the meantime, gearing up for their next one, they're negotiating landings in Australia as their next possibility. Now, by coincidence, this works out pretty well for them because the U.S. independently had just concluded an agreement with Australia that they can launch U.S. loads. I and mean, that's an, you have to have an agreement for that because they're sensitive technology. Typically, if you're going to be a foreign country launching, you better have safeguards in place. And luckily, they have that. This actually says that this company, if they have to, could be based out of Australia or still be based in the U.S., but launch out of Australia. There is a general problem here. The government just isn't keeping up. There is a lot more launches, a lot of commercial activity. And Varda was one example. The other big one is Starship. The holdups that have gone on and on for that. Nobody believed that SpaceX could get Starship put back together and ready to go for the next test as quickly as they did. But they've been sitting there for a couple of months now. And there's a problem. There's so many agencies that are involved in this. You got the FCC for communications. 
the Federal Aviation Administration is the big one right now. They control the airspace and the military as well if it affects military bases. Some cases, the military has to approve things, especially if there's exports or other military implication. The State Department gets involved when there's foreign treaties involved. I don't know why the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has anything to say, but they apparently have something to say, too. Um, the EPA for launch sites, and that makes sense. Potentially, there could be damage because of that. And the current thing holding up Starship is fish and wildlife. They're worried about the water deluge system. Apparently, too much pure water is a concern, and they still are waiting for approval from that. So that's just kind of an indication of where the problems are here. Things are getting so bad, there's been a congressional hearing back in October where three of the companies, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic, and a couple of outside experts testified at a congressional hearing. And FAA in particular was kind of singled out. They had recently supposedly streamlined their procedures, but apparently they've actually made it worse. They're saying licensing takes longer than the rocket development, stifling innovation, and everybody's saying, FAA, please staff up. We need more staff. You need a streamlined process, and you simply need more people to do the job because there's a lot more work to do. FAA actually is refusing. They're kind of sore because they felt they're not getting enough for their existing job, for managing aviation in normal airspace. And so they're saying, no, we're not going to do it. What they just said recently, just the last couple of days, is maybe if you guys gave us some money, we could do it. Now, that's not completely crazy because they do extract fees from the aviation industry. But what they pretty much said was, people are complaining, and yet I'm not even doing the job that I'm supposed to be doing with airplanes. And at least they give me some money. So obviously there's ongoing resolution that has to be worked on here. What these people are saying is, you kind of need a single hub for authorizing commercial space activity. And FAA might not be the right place for that. They're saying we risk losing the lead in spaceflight. And it's not just China. There's places that just don't do so much regulation. Luxembourg, you probably never think of Luxembourg as being a space power. Actually, they've got like 50 space companies there. They have the equivalent of NASA, except what they do is they just promote business of space and nothing else. And as a result, they have companies like SES, the people that do a lot of communication satellites. But despite the dysfunction with FAA, actually, there are people saying we should have the FAA control everything in space. This would be manufacturing, mining, space hotels, satellite servicing, solar power satellites, commercial missions to Mars, Venus, or asteroids, structures on the moon. Can you imagine the FAA being put in the position of issuing building permits for a lab on the moon? The whole idea is so nuts. It's so far outside of their expertise. NSS actually has, the National Space Society has taken a stand on this. They're proposing the approvals belong in the Department of Commerce, because at least there's somebody who wants to see the United States and others succeed in space. Because it's kind of a problem. That there's no government agency that sees space development as their major role. NASA actually doesn't. They just see it as science, first of all. And then for the manned missions, kind of their main priority, they're still thinking of the old days 50 years ago of prestige. You know, we're going to do flags and footprints. We're going to send people out for five days to land on the moon or Mars. That's still a lot of the thinking there. They actually have said that they don't believe it's their responsibility to do that much space development. Now, the reality is NASA is doing a lot of stuff that is aiding in that, mostly the science behind a lot of what has to get done. And there are a lot of individuals and small groups that are working toward that. But for the agency as a whole, it's not really their place. And they're not really regulators anyway. That's not really an appropriate role for them. But somebody needs to be in that position. Okay, a few minor things. One bit of regulation that is creeping up here, and that's on space debris, orbital debris. The FCC actually fined DISH Network uh, $150,000. That's not a lot of money, but it's an indication that people are starting to get serious about orbital debris removal. They had an old satellite, Echostar 7, that was finished. Normally, these are ones that are way up in geosynchronous orbit. That They normally are supposed to go up to a higher graveyard kind of an orbit. They didn't make it all the way, and they actually got fined for that, essentially bad planning. What the DISH Network had said was, Oh, we just realized we didn't have enough fuel to actually get there. Yeah, well, sure. yeah, that was probably fair. Um, second topic here, a really quick one here, and that's that Space Force, which of course is an arm of the military, they are testing refueling in orbit. Now, this is quite a small project, but it's interesting because it used to be, that, especially around NASA, nobody could even talk about that kind of thing because it kind of competed with SLS. Now, actually, both the military and NASA want refueling in orbit, so there's a whole lot going on. NASA needs it because that's built into the Artemis plan. To get people to the moon and back, they actually have to refuel Starship in orbit. So now everybody wants it. It's just interesting how the times change. They go from, you're not even allowed to talk about it, to, my gosh, we have to have it tomorrow. Small item, Astra, we've talked about them before. They were the ones who did the launch where it literally went sideways. You know, it kind of couldn't quite make it. They are pretty much on the edge of bankruptcy. 
they've used up all their loan money. Turns out the founders have offered to take the company private for about 30 million or so. So they may yet survive. At the other small launcher, Rocket Lab, they had had a failure, which was really the first in a long time. And they've been grounded since September. It looks like they're starting back up at the end of this month. So that's pretty much it, other than how many launches. And this is two months. So whatever your normal estimate might have been for this, maybe double it. That's just a clue. This particular mission shown in the picture here was a cargo mission, a SpaceX cargo dragon going up to the space station. 41, 49. The right answer is 38. What are they? As usual, you know, most of them are SpaceX launching Starlink satellites and Chinese launching mostly military satellites and their commercial satellites that are competing with the commercial ones from everybody else. There are some unusual ones I'll at least highlight here. There's one launched by the U.S. It was a U.S. spy satellite, but what's different about this one is a geosynchronous orbit like the old-fashioned ones always were. But this one is not really looking at Earth. This one is looking at the other satellites that are up there. We'd actually kind of talked about that a little bit in the last couple of meetings because there's so much going on where, where satellites are launched and then they go and they, they're tracking. There's sort of an implied threat that if anything ever happens, we can just blow up your satellite. And so we're basically sending signals back. And that's why they publicized this, that, by the way, this satellite is just going up to keep an eye on you other guys. So now the reality is the Chinese and the Russians have also done that before. This is not the first time. This is the first time I think we've actually admitted that. Another military one, the, the, interesting, that's Firefly. They had their Alpha rocket. It finally worked. And it was actually kind of a stressful test because what they're testing is, in this case, the Air Force is funding what they want as a responsive launch. They give an order for a satellite to go up, and within 24 hours, they want someone to be able to do it. And so they had a test of that, and it actually worked. It was a success for Firefly Alpha, but in fact, technically, they failed the test because it was supposed to be 24 hours from go signal to the Launch. True. Hey, it's hours, but well, actually, the reason was they had to wait because there was a launch window had to open up. So I think they could have timed their request a little better to make it actually fit within 24 hours. But it probably wasn't quite possible in that maybe it had to be like 26 or something. There was a question on the varying numbers of satellites in the Starlink launches. Well, the ones that are 22 are typically the ones that are out of Cape Canaveral, and especially because they're often the ones that are launching at the lower angle of inclination, so they're getting more advantage from rotation of the Earth. The other ones are coming out of Vandenberg, and typically they're going a little bit more polar. They just can't do as much. The difference is one satellite. There were a couple of failures. The Electron from Rocket Lab, they had a failure. That was really their first in ages. And also the Chinese had one as well. This is one of their quasi-public companies. They're meant to be kind of like private enterprise. The Iranians sent up a satellite. The last few of theirs have failed. This one actually did succeed. This might be the first time they had a full success on orbiting a satellite. Oh yeah, Amazon's Project Kuiper. We talked about that some last month. They finally actually put up a couple of satellites. And these are just for test purposes. But these are the first ones they've ever actually launched. And you know they want to get another 3,000 or so up there in a few more years. They haven't even tested them out yet. So this will be interesting to see how that works. But at least they finally made some progress on that. They were partially tied up by the fact that they kept picking vendors that didn't actually have rockets available for use yet. So they had reserved a few slots on these old Atlas V rockets that have been sitting around, and they finally decided, the heck with it. We'll waste the whole Atlas V to launch a couple of satellites because they're getting desperate. They, they, they really realize they're running out of time before they lose their license. We talked about the Psyche asteroid mission. The Chinese launched to their space station. We launched to ours. It's tough to ever report on the Chinese satellites because they don't really necessarily tell you what they're really doing because everything is kind of dual use. I mean, like, okay, the earth mapping satellites. Yeah, what does that mean? But in this case, it was really kind of glaring. They officially said they launched one satellite for earth observation. However, by tracking, they could see there were actually two of them. So that freed up a whole second satellite. Nobody knows what that one's for. And they're not, you know, they're not going to talk. So, and the reality is we probably do some of that same kind of stuff. And usually it gets caught. This was a case where they got caught. Transporter 9, the Falcon, what they call transporter pride. These are the ones where you take lots and lots of payloads. Uh, in this case, there were 90 of them. And some of those payloads actually probably have multiple satellites inside of them because they're little space tugs. They take them out to get into different orbits and then they release them. So who knows how many satellites are actually going up there. SSO? There was a question on SSO, which stands for Sun Synchronous Orbit. Yeah, so they're basically polar orbits, pretty low Earth. Um, the key thing there is that you go over the same place on Earth at the same time each day. 
So that's really useful for any kind of surveillance, even mapping forests or whatever, because you can watch things change week to week, whatever it is, and you know you're going to have the same lighting conditions each time. It's called sun-synchronous orbits. They're usually nearly polar orbits. And um, actually, SpaceX is now going to offer some of the similar capability for um, more normal inclinations, like the 43 degree, meaning closer to the equator. Instead of going over the poles, they're going to be circling much, much uh, closer to the equator, which is where a lot of satellites want to be. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yeah. So, uh, is India on hold? Okay, the question was, is India on hold? I, I don't think so. I mean, their moon mission is over. Basically didn't survive the night, but that was as expected, so that's okay. They are going ahead with their manned program, and they've got experimentation going on with that. I don't think they're holding anything up. I think they're kind of going gung-ho. Their programs are ongoing. And now, especially now that they've landed on the moon where nobody else had managed to land close to the pole, you know, there's a whole national pride kind of thing kicking in there, so you can bet they're going to be doing even more. Well, they'll probably start attracting more commercial customers, too, because they're doing things so much cheaper than everybody else. They do it because they don't pay their people anything. Uh, <laughs> you got, what, 1.3 billion or whatever people. The cream of the crop, they focus them all in science and technology, and, and they got to have jobs for those people. And, well, by golly, they're out there now, and you know, they're, right, they're going to lead the pack, I'm sure. Historically, they based their whole program pretty much on the Russian space program all along. And they had a lot of technical help along the way from the Russians. So they were tied in pretty closely to the Russians. Now, they've been diverging, I mean, politically to some extent, but also certainly technically, they have been adding a lot of their own. All this stuff is landing on the moon. This is them. And they did a good job on that. I guess that's pretty much it. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a web page and also a list of videos at my YouTube channel. So you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and a link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.